Edison now, and then everyone in the recording will be mad at me yeah. for like knocking off yeah. like, yeah. half of the yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, I would assume so. Yeah, I'm like, talking right next to it. Yeah. <laughs> oh no. We, we, we can't be like quietly whispering yeah. about things we don't understand. You can just put things out and it'll take a minute. The back is always the same bed. Okay, let's get started, I guess. Actually, hadn't looked at my calendar properly, and I showed up here an hour ago and I walked into the room like, oh no, when's it going to take me in the course already? <laughs> Like, no, okay. <laughs> uh, so, uh, last time uh, we talked about uh, the basic definitions, we talked about what a Hilbert space was, we talked about what an orthonormal basis was, and we went through these four equivalent definitions of, a, of what it means for an orthonormal set to be an orthonormal basis. Can anyone remember any of those? What does it mean for an orthonormal set to be a, a basis? So, um, is the inner product of some, um, so with, with everything that basis is zero, then it has to be zero. Uh, yeah, one hand, great. But, um, yep, that's know, exactly right. Yeah, so, if, if yeah. Yeah. so if you, if yeah. for every vector f, uh, yeah. so for all f, uh, I can input ei equals zero, uh, uh, well, and for all uh, that <laughs> implies f equals zero, uh, then that whole statement there tells you that. What was the actual definition? It's dense in the Hilbert space. The no, the, the basis isn't dense. Oh yeah, yeah. yeah but yeah. the finite linear combinations of the basis are dense. And what else was there on our list of equivalent drops? S properties? N of F converges. So what? So what's S N of F? That's just notation. It's tell, me, tell me what it's really about. The linear projections of um, F onto the basis vectors. Yeah. A finite combination of basis vectors. Yeah. So, so, so like the idea is just that if you take the sum up to some fixed point of uh, these guys, so this is, you should think of this as the projection of f onto the span of the first n plus one things, but that's actually converging to f. And uh, so that justifies, then you can write that f is equal to uh, the infinite sum of these guys. So every vector really is equal to, where this equal of course means you're taking some limiting process on the side, but it's equal to uh, the appropriate linear combination. And what was the last one? Sum of up to the value of pi squared. Yeah. Yeah. So we had um, we had Bessel's in inequality, which was that uh, that was always smaller than. I think it's still uh, round. Bigger. Yes. Yep. Very good. Yep. That one's always bigger than uh, the sum of the squares of those projections. And you have equality uh, if and only if uh, the di's are a basis. Great. Okay, so uh, we spend, I guess, probably the rest of today talking about uh, closed subspaces and then about, uh, well, actually, no, closed but we'll, we'll, we'll get ahead of that. We'll see. So, okay. Uh, Everyone knows what it means to be a subspace of the Hilbert space. That's just a vector subspace of the Hilbert space thought of as a vector space. But a subspace in infinite dimensions doesn't need to be closed. Do we have good examples or of, a, of either a subspace of the Hilbert space that is closed or a subspace of the Hilbert space that isn't closed? Space generated by a single vector should be closed. Ah, yeah, okay, great. Yeah, so um, the span <coughs> of F is closed. And in fact, um, the span of F1 through Fn, the span of some finite collection of vectors, uh, is closed as well. Okay, those are good. 
those web spaces? What else? In either direction. Oh, no, no, but we want, we want, we want, no, no, I want complex, no, no, we're talking, corporate spaces are complex vector spaces, but I, we're not going to step outside the world of complex vector spaces. So I want a complex subspace of a corporate <coughs> space. That's, that might be closed or not. But you were talking about rational linear combinations, and that's not a complex corporate space. So that's, that's way outside what we... That's the no, Lehman integrable functions? The what? Lehman integrable functions? Uh, in... In L2. Uh, sure, yeah. Uh, uh, I'm not close. Sure it's <coughs> L2. Certainly, finite, uh, I mean, this is certainly a subspace, finite linear combination, so these things are still in here. Uh, but you can take limits of things that are Riemann integrable and end up still in L2, but not in Riemann integrable. Let's do, it, uh, let's do a much easier one that's easier to see. Uh, continuous functions in L2. Maybe that's a. Oh, <coughs> sorry about that. I'll oh, cross out this one. I give you this one just because it's so much easier to see what's going on here. Okay? This is certainly a, a vector subspace, but there's no reason to expect that it's closed. In the, in the topology that L2 gives you, um, these functions converge to uh, this perfectly good L2 function. Converging in the L2 sense, but not converging in the supremum sense. Yeah? In the supremum norm, this is very far from any of those continuous functions. But in the L2 sense, these bump functions converge. Yeah? Main, uh, wait, L, uh, for L2n, uh, hopefully this is a subspace, um, the guys that are uh, zero after some finite cutoff. Um, after some Variable finite cutoff or fixed yes, finite cutoff? Yes, as long as there is one. Ah, uh, okay. Yeah. yeah. And, so and that seems like a subspace, but also I can take a uh, limit that doesn't convert. Great. In the Finitely space. supported sequences. That's actually a really nice one. Okay. Finite linear combinations here. Still left in here. But certainly you can uh, uh, you can write anything in L2 as a limit of these guys just by truncating after some point. To go further and further and further. Maybe another example is like, you could take L2R, and in that you could take functions uh, vanishing almost everywhere, say on some set, like on, on 0, 1. Okay? That's an infinite dimensional subspace. This, well, this is infinite dimensional as well. So this, is, this is infinite dimensional. Um, that condition is closed under the vector space operations. But, uh, <coughs> oh, oh, yeah, but this, so this one is closed. So what am I doing? This one is closed for once. Okay. This wasn't closed. <coughs> Not closed. And this is, is an example of a all two closed subspace. Does that only contain one element? No, no, no. I mean, like, this function here. <coughs> Perfectly good function that vanishes on zero one in L2. Okay, I was thinking L2 of zero one. Oh, no, no, yeah, L2 of yeah, R, cool. yeah, yeah, yeah. So I'm just saying, like, take some small subset of the whole domain, make it vanish there. But any time you do that, functions vanishing on some closed subset will be in a, a closed subspace. Okay, enough examples. Are people, are people, is anyone, does anyone want to ask me about any one of these examples and complain about it, that you don't know exactly what I'm talking about, or you don't believe that it's closed or not closed? Why is the last one closed? Why is the last one closed? Yeah, okay. So, what do we need to do? Um, I guess I didn't think about this very much. Um, well, suppose I have a limit like that. Yeah, so, I mean, I think the idea is that if you, if you have some f now that uh, that doesn't vanish on some kind of positive measure set, then uh, we can say that maybe on that positive measure set, the absolute value of the function, or maybe not on, maybe on some smaller but still positive measure set, we can see that the function value is, a, is at least epsilon. And then every function that's actually in this set will be, 
will be bounded away in L2 norm from that function because on that little set there, you'll see uh, that the, like the, the L2 distance will be at least epsilon squared times the, the measure of that little set. So if you had anything that's, um, that does, that's not in this set, then you can actually produce some bound so that everything in the set is at least that far away from it. So, the, so what we really proved here was that the complement of the set was open. Yeah, maybe uh, if you weren't quite sure about that, that answer, go back and think about it. That's a great, uh, that's a great one to be careful of. Okay, so let's, rather than give billions of examples now, let's just state the important bits of the important bits of theory about closed subspaces. So what do we need to say? The big thing is maybe just this, that uh, if E is just some subset of the Hilbert space, we define E perp to be all the F in the Hilbert space such that the inner product of F with little e is zero for every e in the set we're taking the, the orthogonal complement of. So this is e perp, or, or the orthogonal complement, whatever you want to call it. Uh, and this is always a closed subspace. It's pretty obviously a vector subspace. This condition is linear in F. And just the fact that, that we're describing these functions by saying, um, some continuous function of it is zero. Like this is, you could alternatively think of this as an intersection over all E and E of the functions oh, sorry, of the functions F. So F E equals zero. So this gadget here is some continuous function from the Hilbert space to the complex numbers, taking F and taking its inner product with the fixed E. So each of these sets is closed, and that's an infinite intersection of closed sets. So it's always closed, and maybe it's worth pointing out um, that this means that uh, there are lots of interesting closed subspaces in the Hilbert space, and when we eventually, much later in the course, get to Banach spaces, this is sort of an important distinction, there are Banach <coughs> spaces that are so horrible that you can't even point to a single closed subspace of them besides the zero set and the whole space. The Hilbert spaces are just full of closed, closed subspaces. So uh, the two theorems, I guess, we, we need to get going are um, if S is a closed subspace, then you can write the Hilbert space as S uh, direct sum S perp as inner product spaces. So what does that statement even mean? So we need to show um, well, what do we need to show? We need to show that S intersect S perp is just zero. So something to be a direct sum, zero in particular saying that the only thing that's in both sets is the is the zero vector. Uh, every F in H can be written uh, as F equals S plus T for some S in the set S and T in S perp. And then this fact here, once if you've already established this, in fact, uh, this is the same to same, can be written uniquely in this way, okay? If you, if you could write it two different ways, then that would uh, give you elements of this, okay? And, but there's a little bit more. So these facts are just saying that H is isomorphic to S direct sum S perp as vector spaces. We want this to be a, uh, an isomorphism as inner product spaces. So we should maybe say the maps F goes to S. Because at that point, I mean, at this point, we, we can think of this as a function, like the unique 
a unique S so that you can write F like this. And F goes to T, a continuous max. And finally, uh, maybe we should ask that the inner product of F uh, of F with G is the inner product of S with S prime plus the inner product of T with T prime. We're here saying F is S plus T. I just noticed people up the back training to see the bottom of the board. Should I avoid using the bottom of the board, or are you coping? No. How much can I use? Can I write down to about here, or? <laughs> Someone's got to express an opinion. <coughs> Where should I stop? Okay. Just crane Okay. Okay. So I think that's everything that we're meant to show to prove this theorem. So, yeah, yeah, I mean, I, uh, I wondered about that as, as, as I was writing it. So, you sort of have um, maybe, this is a bit of a subtle point, there may be two different ways you can interpret the symbol direct sum. If we just think of these guys as vector spaces or Hilbert spaces, then you should think that sort of the direct sum symbol is just making some new vector space over here. Or you could think that, well, we're thinking of S and S perp as subspaces of some fixed guy H. And then writing <coughs> S direct sum means, well, we're taking the vector space that's the span of the two, still as a subspace of, of H. So under the latter interpretation, where you're thinking of these as subspaces and this symbol is building a new subspace, then we really should be writing this. We're saying that the whole Hilbert space is just the span of those two, and the direct sum symbol also tells us this guy. Whereas if you're thinking of the direct sum symbol as building some new vector space over here, then it would be more appropriate to write isomorphism, because, um, well, this isn't necessarily a subset. Maybe it's, given we haven't actually talked about unitary isomorphism of vector spaces, maybe it's better we write equal and we'll think of, we'll think of S do, as direct sum symbols, meaning uh, one, that these don't intersect except in the zero vector, and then this means the span of the. Okay, Thank, that's a, a good objection. Thank you. Okay, so what if this is easy and what if this is hard? talked about what it means already for two Hilbert spaces to be equivalent, and I'd written an isomorphism there, and then this would uh, make a little bit more sense. Um, maybe, uh, let's, let's just actually punt on the question, and for now, let, just take on faith that, that maybe this is really what I should have written as the statement of the theorem, and later maybe when, when we've said what unitary equivalence of Hilbert spaces is, you can come back and see that that if I'd written an isomorphism symbol here, that statement really would mean those four things. Yeah, so, so now let's just take this as this. Spaces, then that's how you should find the yeah, um, yeah. yeah. Well, uh, let, let's try and come back to that. For now, let's just take on faith that those are the four things we're meant to be proving. Think of these as the actual statement of the theorem. Yeah. And that just is shorthand for this stuff. So which one of these four is easy? One of them is really easy. Yeah, the first one, I think, is, is easy. You just can't have anything uh, that's perpendicular to, um, in particular, if the vector is perpendicular to itself, then it's the zero vector. Okay, so that, that immediately shows you that that's, that's not. Okay, so what do we do? Um, well, the idea is just pick off a normal basis. for S and S perp, which we know we can do because uh, 
they reach Hilbert spaces separately. They close the subspaces of a Hilbert space. Sorry, I guess I didn't actually explicitly say that, but <laughs> we definitely should have closed subspaces of H are themselves Hilbert spaces. Okay. So we, by our theorem at the very end of yesterday, where we used a bit of Graham Schmidt, you can just construct orthonormal bases for both of those. And then take the union and we claim uh, that's an orthonormal basis for the whole Hilbert space. Okay? So how do we check that? Well, um, so say I think I should have given these names. I took them. EI, an orthonormal basis for S, and FI, an orthonormal basis for S product. So say we know that F in a product EI is always zero, and F in a product FI is always zero. Uh, this is sort of using property number two of, uh, of that theorem about different versions of orthonormal bases. We need to show People see how that's the what we need to do to show that it's an orthonormal basis. Okay. Um, so why is that true? Yeah. If we suppose. So we say we've got that f, like in a product of f and ei, is zero. Yep. For all the ei, then that means that it's going to be in s product of f. Exactly. Yeah. Which and it's and that means that in a product of f and yep. s is zero, and you get the result. Great. Yeah. So one tells you that <coughs> yeah, um, yeah. that f uh, is perpendicular to everything in s, because everything in s we can write as a a limit of inner product, uh, sorry, is a limit of, of finite linear combinations of the EIs, and so that gives you that. And then this is in, then the fact that the FIs with an orthonormal basis for S perp. And then two tells you. So, okay. And once we've done that, it's sort of all over and easy from here, okay? Because uh, you can then write F as a sum of f in the product ei times eis plus a sum of f in the product fis times fis. That's that last fact we learned about orthonormal bases. And then these two bits here, we can just define our s as that and our t as that and see that we get a, a way of decomposing f as a sum of something in s and something in s perf. And then uh, I'll leave it for you guys. Uh, check the remaining two obligations. We may still need to check those two facts. Claiming they're both pretty easy. Once you've got these explicit formulas for what S and T are. Okay. Um, So then the other fact about closed subspaces we'll use, and this is something that we'll talk about a fair bit more in the tutorial uh, next Monday, there's a good problem set problem on it. Uh, if S is closed in H, and, uh, and we've got some point F in H, There is a unique closest point. Well, maybe there's no unique. Well, yeah, I can say unique. There is unique closest point to F in S. 
Okay, so this is just um, asserting something that in finite dimensions is super easy. That there's exactly one point in S that is closer to F than any other point in, in S. Okay, that's very familiar from the finite dimensional case. And uh, the, the proof of this is very easy. We just write F as S plus T. And then we claim that uh, S is closer to F than any other uh, S prime in S. And how do you do that? Well, you just look at the distance from S to S prime. Um, write that as um, f minus, let's see what do we do, um, like so. But now let's think, this is of course just t, okay, and this, whatever it is, is in s, so in particular those two bits are orthogonal, okay. Uh, so maybe let's square everything, so we're allowed to use Pythagoras, uh, and that's then just the distance from F to S all squared, plus the distance from S to S prime all squared, and in particular that's at least as big as the distance from F to S all squared, with equality exactly if S equals S prime. Okay. So that, that, that's what gave us uniqueness. The only way S prime could be as close as if S minus S prime is zero. And again, um, this is a fact that is true for Hilbert spaces and just not true for more general things, Banach spaces, and we'll talk about that in the, in the tutorial. We'll sort of see like in, in L1 of R, this, just, this fact just doesn't work, okay? You can have, uh, it just might not be at a point that's closest. You can see what the distance ought to be, but there's no point that it's actually sitting there at that distance away. Okay, uh, great. So after this, we need to start talking about linear functionals and, um, and linear transformations and what it means for these things to be continuous. So have you guys um, seen this idea that uh, a linear transformation is, um, is bounded exactly if it's continuous? So continuity is the same thing as being bounded? Some people have seen it. Have some people not seen this? Some people have not seen this? Okay, so let's, uh, yeah, I don't think I intended to cover it. So, okay. Uh, let's, let's do linear functionals first. So first of all, what is a linear function? So uh, we say psi is bounded by m, say something in the positive real numbers, if the absolute value of psi of x is always less than m times the norm of x. And that's for all x in the Hilbert space. Okay, so I have to use double bars there because I'm talking about the norms only in the Hilbert space, and here just single bars because this is just a complex number. Okay, and, uh, and of course you say psi is bounded if it's bounded uh, for some n. And then the norm of psi is the infimum of m. And of course, I mean, this, uh, this set of m's such that psi is bounded by m might be empty, in which case the infimum is infinite, and then you, you, I guess you would say then the norm is infinite, okay? But that would be an unbounded linear function. Okay, and so 
the great lemon now is that psi is a continuous map in the Hilbert space of the complex numbers. So both of these things have topologies on them, they've got, both got metrics on them, so we can talk about them being continuous, if and only if psi is bounded. So what do we need to do? Well, we've got, we've got to, we have to prove an if and only if, so we're just going to have to go back and forth. So let's just say um, we've got this first fact. Um, okay, then proving continuity is really easy from here. So um, we, because all that we, we see is just that um, psi of x minus psi of y, that's just the same thing, of course, because psi is linear, is that is then bounded by m times the norm of x minus y. That tells you psi is continuous, and you could unpack that into the epsilons and deltas. Um, should I bother? No, nah, okay, just, okay. Um, yeah, let's see how long I can go without actually writing the letter epsilon on the board. Uh, <laughs> it won't be that long, we'll get there eventually. We'll need plenty of them later. Um, okay, and then in the other direction, what do you do? Well, um, Psi is continuous. Well, I think we're going to have to use epsilons and deltas at this point. Uh, there exists a delta positive. Well, okay, let's actually make life even easier. So if psi is continuous, it is continuous uh, at the point zero. Okay. Uh, continuity everywhere implies continuity in the point. Uh, so there exists some delta. So as long as x is within delta of zero, then uh, psi of x is bounded by, well, whatever epsilon we liked. Let's just pick epsilon to be one, okay? But now uh, you can just use linearity and squeeze it in this little box here. So then we can compute psi of any x like the fault like this. We can look at. Um, we just want to make the argument sufficiently small. So let's take psi divided. Oh, sorry, x there. X divided by the norm of x uh, times. Um, let's even let's just take delta over two. But then of course we've got to put those factors on the outside. So we're talking about the same thing here. Maybe I'm assuming that the norm of x is not zero, but you can treat that case really easily. So now the argument that we've shoved into psi satisfies this condition, okay? We just made it, here we made its norm one, and here we made its norm even smaller than delta. And so this condition applies, so that's smaller than uh, the norm of x divided by delta times two times one, okay? And that's exactly giving me bound, boundedness. That the size of, oh, I needed absolute values there. Okay, that's exactly saying that psi of x is bounded by two over delta. Okay. You look unhappy. Tell me what you're unhappy about. Uh, okay, yeah, so I mean, all that I'm doing here is scaling the argument yeah. by some yeah. scalar and putting that same scale, one over that scalar out the front. Mm -hmm. So that I'm allowed to think about what psi looks like. I mean, so I'm allowed to use this condition. I'm only allowed to, mm -hmm. I only know something about psi when its argument is very small. Mm -hmm. So I just pull the scalar out the front to make the argument very small. And then I can keep track of that scalar afterwards. Right? Um, great. So, what now? Uh, oh, but let's. Is it okay if I edit in place? Uh, so, a, a linear transformation. H to K is a linear map. H to K 
okay. And we say, we certainly wouldn't use psi, we use t. Uh, we say t is bounded uh, by m if, well, when you apply t to x, we can't take its absolute value anymore because we're landing in some arbitrary k, but we can take the norm. But the norm of t of x is bounded by m times the norm of x. Okay? So notice this is a strict generalization of the definition so far. Um, and the complex numbers was a Hilbert space. So one just specializes to, to the previous definition. The norm of t is still the infimum of the m's so that t is bounded by m. And we can just keep editing this lemma. t is a continuous map from a to k if and only if t is bounded. And uh, I think at this point I'll just leave it as an exercise for you guys. Please actually do it to check that search and replace in this proof leaves a valid proof of, of this fact, okay? Uh, you need to change some absolute values to norms in places, but the exact same argument should go here. Okay, so that's the that's this fundamental fact about boundedness and continuity being the same thing. So to, rather than having to check what your linear map does everywhere and thinking about continuity in the usual topological sense, all that you've got to do is check that it never... Um, it never makes vectors sort of make, makes vectors arbitrarily larger by interaction. Okay. Uh, the really important fact about linear functionals, let's go back to them, is the Reese representation theorem. It's sort of confusingly, <laughs> there are many different Reese representation theorems that mean very different things. Um, <coughs> this one should be called the, uh, I don't know, the baby Reese representation theorem. This one's a really easy one, um, and then we'll get to a much harder one. It's about a completely different subject uh, later <laughs> on. Okay. So what's this about? Well, um, any vector g in a Hilbert space gives a linear functional via f maps to in a product of f with g. Okay? We have to write it this way around because a linear functional is meant to be a linear map and the inner product is only linear in the first half, not the second half. Um, it's a bounded, linear trend, a bounded linear functional because of... So why is it continuous? Uh, we can do better than that. <laughs> let's, let's, let's directly show that it's bounded. So we need to show that the absolute value of f times g is bounded by some number times the norm of f. Hopefully this is looking pretty familiar by now. Yeah, it's, the norm it's, of g. it's the only inequality we know. Uh, <laughs> yeah, Percy Schwartz says that this is less than the norm of f times the norm of g. Okay. So in fact, you can see uh, it's bounded and has norm. From this, we can see that it's got norm exactly the norm of g. Okay? So you could think of this as a map. As a map. Uh, what's a good letter? <laughs> so that's some notation. But a Hilbert space with a star on it just means. of linear functionals of, uh, of bounded linear functionals and we don't quite need it yet but uh, it's something maybe you can think about uh, actually this is a Hilbert space too okay? so linear functionals you can define an inner product on those and you can see that it's complete with respect to that inner product and this is this is actually a map of Hilbert spaces. But for now, maybe just think of this as a, a we, we've just defined this as a vector space. It's a vector space of all bounded linear functionals. And we've defined this map by, it's the map that sends G to the linear functional that sends F to F inner product G, okay? 
And the Reese representation theorem says that uh, that uh, well, maybe easier than the Reese representation theorem. Um, it's easy to see this as in, an injective map. Nothing gets sent to zero except the zero vector, because the thing we send little g to has norm norm of g. Okay, so only the zero vector gets sent has has gets sent to something with zero norm. So this map's injective. And the Reese representation theorem is that J is surjective. So actually, i.e., uh, every linear functional. is of this form. That is, for every linear functional, you can find some vector G. So actually, your linear, all your linear functional is, is take inner products with that fixed G. Again, uh, and maybe I'm just going to keep saying this until eventually I get bored of saying it. Uh, this is yet another way in which Hilbert spaces are much more wonderful than Banach spaces. Uh, this is far, far from true for a general Banach space when we get there. They're going to have oodles of linear functionals on them. They will have, well, actually, some Banach spaces have oodles of linear functionals and some have almost none at all. So we've got very little control over them. But for Hilbert spaces, we know exactly what the linear functionals are. <coughs> okay. So, how does the proof of this go. So, uh, uh, so say uh, psi is a linear function. Our job is to construct the corresponding G. Okay. So let's let N uh, be the kernel of psi, so just everything in H that gets sent to zero. And then the first claim is just that uh, uh, the orthogonal complement of n is actually just one dimension. And the proof of this claim is really easy. So um, how do you prove that some vector space is one dimensional? You just show that if you've got any two vectors in there, they're scalar multiples of each other. Let's say uh, x and y are union per. Um, what do we do? Um, well, uh, psi of x and psi of y are in the complex numbers. So there exists some a and b. So a psi of x plus b psi of y complex numbers themselves are one-dimensional. Okay. Uh, but then, um, psi of ax plus by equals zero. So ax plus by is in n per, but of course it's, uh, oh, it is in n. n was by definition the null space. But it's also in n per, because it's a linear combination of things in n per. Ax plus by equals zero, and we finished with the little claim that n perp is just one dimensional. Now, if a space is one dimensional, you can pick g non-zero. Let's pick g prime for a moment because we're going to need to fix it. Uh, pick g prime non-zero in n perp. Uh, oh, 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 oh! I've kind of screwed up here. What, what have I screwed up? Exactly, yeah, the n perp, or not, not quite the kernel might be zero. The kernel might be everything. The kernel could be the whole Hilbert space, and it might actually be the n perp is zero dimensional. Uh, so let's uh, just add a little suppose here. Suppose psi is not equal to zero. So why are we safe doing that? Well, if psi was equal to zero, then it's easy to see that's in the image of j. You could have just picked g to be the zero vector. So we're allowed to just do that. Uh, so 
pick g prime non-zero in there, and then uh, scale it to some g. So uh, what's the normalization we want? We want psi of g equals the norm of g squared. And then we can see why we can do this. So psi of g prime is some non-zero number. And so, uh, so psi of g prime equals k. What would you do to make this work? Well, if g is alpha g prime, what do we get? Then uh, psi of g is equal to uh, alpha k, and the norm of g squared is equal to alpha squared times the norm of g prime. And now the claim is that you can just uh, you can just solve this equation for alpha to fix on alpha. So that that rescaling of, of g prime really gives you a g to do that. Okay, so we can produce a vector that does that. And then H, remember, is n direct cell main perf. So F in H can be written as F in here is one of those things. H plus Z times G, some H in the null space, and Z in the complex numbers. OK? But now, now it's really easy. Uh, What's psi of f? Well, psi of f is psi of h is automatically zero by definition, plus z times psi of g, z times the norm of g squared, uh, and uh, what? So we're we're, we're almost there. What we want is that this is equal to the inner product of f with g. So we just need to work out what z is here. Maybe I should have done that first. Um, so let's just do that. So notice uh, f inner product g equals h inner product g, that's 0, plus uh, z inner product of g with itself. That goes to zero because h was in n and g was in g perf, and so we've got what we want. So psi of f is in a product of f with that g. Okay. So I think, yeah, I mean, maybe uh, sorry. I think I handled this a little bit awkwardly, uh, seeing that you can go from g prime to g. I had to think about that if that was if that felt a bit ugly. Um, but hopefully the rest of it fits together. Yeah. Can you also do this like? In the finite, like the thing is like the finite dimensional way, like we put the image of an orthonormal basis and like piece it together. By a, a, you know, a G. Ooh, so we, which bit are you trying to do? Uh, oh, like to so find the whole thing. G. Yeah. Um. <coughs> ah, I see. Okay, so because um, if you ask me to do this, that's what I would try to do. Yeah. Okay. We don't have time to do anything else today, so let's see if we can try it this way. So say we have uh, psi in the linear functionals and EI an orthonormal basis for H. Okay, so then um, psi of a sum AI EI is certainly then the sum of psi's of EI's. Sure. So, what did you have in mind after that? Or so, like, uh, like you know, if you, um, uh, like, so we can like def g is like uniquely defined by what it does to each basis vector, right? Uh, psi is psi. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. Yeah. So this is telling us that once we know the values of psi and all the eyes, we know what psi does to everything. 
right by this one. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, right. But I don't quite see how that gives us a G. Oh, I see. So, no, no. Um, Mm. Okay, but okay. So let's, on the other hand, calculate what um, what we would get if we took that an inner product of it with f mm -hmm. uh, with uh, with g, some g that we don't know yet. What would this look like? Well, that of course would be the sum of a i's e i g. So what we want to do is pick some g. Oh yeah, this, this is actually going to work. Really. Yeah, so what we want here is that e i in the product of g equals yeah. psi of yeah. e i three e i. Okay, so the obvious thing to do here is to define uh, g to be uh, the sum the problem is this second slot is anti-linear. So maybe we have to put a conjugate there of those guys. Uh -huh. So if we do that, then this fact will be true. So you've still got to do one more thing for me. You, the, the remaining, the, I agree this proof is working so far. It's got a good candidate for what the G should be. We still need to show, need to show um, that G is actually in H which is saying that that sequence of numbers there was square summable right. for that sum to converge. And that's not totally obvious to me why that would be true. Yeah, okay, we've, sort of, we've run out of time. I intended to get further today. Um, but yeah, if anyone wants to think about it and uh, can see a way of making that work by showing that this formula for G is actually the right one, or is actually in L2, or is, sorry, is actually in H, or that sequence of numbers is in L2, um, then I, yeah, can tell us about it. Um, okay, so timing-wise, I intended to get further today. So that sort of is a bad sign um, that I must be rambling too much. Um, hmm. Maybe let's wait a week and see how things are going timing-wise. Um, uh, maybe I'll also just get you guys, I'll write a little survey for you guys to do. The thing that I'm, we might have to do at some point is either um, skip some bits or have me try and get through things in a more direct line without so many asides. Um, and maybe you guys can think about which of those two options you'd prefer if I think we need to speed up at some point. Uh, whether it's something, I mean, when I say skip things, that means you learn about yourself. <laughs> not, that it's, not that you don't learn. Um, but I, yeah, we, we may have to. And I was a little bit slower than I wanted to. Okay, great. See you guys next week. Um, so remember on Monday, we are no longer in this room. In Mondays, we're diagonally across that way. Copeland G39. It's just to the left of the arch. Um, we'll have the tutorial afterwards. So if you could bring along problem set one or a computer that you can see problem set one on, that would be great. Um, yeah. Uh.